Thank you so much, Jenny. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sarah Perkey, um, to give you a little bit of background on um, Dr. Perkey. She completed her PhD at the University of Washington in 2014 under Greg Johnson. Then she went on to a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the Columbia University um, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory from 2014 to 2017, and then became an assistant professor at Scripps Institute of Oceanography in 2017. Um, Sarah's research focuses on using the available ocean observations to look at decadal variability in ocean heat content, freshwater budgets, and circulation. Um, she's been a contributing author to the chapter on ocean observations on the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, as well as the IPCC Special Report, Oceans and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate. And she is a scientific advisor to the Clivar and Carbon Hydrographic Data Office as well as the official hydro, uh, hydrography, sorry, archive and data management for all WOS and ghost ships cruises. So we're really fortunate to have Sarah speak today um, about one of the priorities of the US Clivar POS panel to engage in the planning or review of new and existing observation systems. And today she's gonna be talking about Deep Argo, which is a um, effort that Scripps and her, her, herself has been involved in for the last three years. Um, and is the subject of this presentation, but they've also been building their own model of a biogeochemistry Argo float, which is very interesting too. So again, we're very fortunate to have Sarah speak today and um, like you all, I'm very excited to hear it. So go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for um, listening to this talk. Um, so like Michelle said, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about our effort to get um, this Deep Argo program uh, up and running. Um, and today I'm going to be showing some slides that I made in collaboration with Natalie Zilberman. Natalie is one of the co-chairs um, of the new Deep Argo Steering Committee. Um, and so for the outline of the talk, I'm just going to start by giving a little bit of background and motivation for why we want to expand Argo into the deep ocean. Um, and then mostly just focus on the current and future status of the program and then end by talking about some cool scientific results that are already coming out of the pilot arrays that we have going. Um, so to start, the reason, the, one of the reasons why we want to go into the deep ocean is because 50% of the ocean volume is actually below 2,000 meters, which is the current limit of Argo. And below the 2,000 meter mark, about 10% of the total change in ocean heat content that we've observed is going below Argo in that deep ocean. And that accounts for about 8% of the steric sea level rise that we've seen since the 1990s. And so what that means is that if we're only resolving the upper ocean, we're looking at about a 10% error. Um, in addition, we've seen some regions of the deep ocean experience some relatively large freshening. Um, so the figure on the top is showing uh, the heat content change in watts per meter squared of, in terms of a flux through the 4,000 meter isobath um, into those deep basins. And basically everywhere that's red is warming and we're seeing the strongest warming in the uh, Southern Ocean near where we have Antarctic bottom water being produced, but it's propagating all the way up. Um, and the other thing I want to note is to get these estimates, we're really limited to these repeat decadal go ship lines. And those lines are the really faint black lines, straight black lines that you see on there. And each of these are occupied once per decade, typically. Um, and it's been going on since the 90s. So we're looking at two, maybe three occupations of these. And from that, we can at best get a decadal estimate of the heat content in each of these basins. Um, and then the figure on the bottom is showing a freshwater flux in centimeters per year. Now it's a polar projection with Antarctica in the middle because really where we're seeing the freshening um, recently is really close to the sources, uh, but we do see quite a bit of freshwater going into the deep ocean. And if you sum all that up, it's about eight gigatons per year. So this is a relatively large flux of freshwater in terms of the uh, freshwater budget of the ocean. Um, the other reason we are really excited about getting deep Argo is to understand the variability uh, in deep circulation and the meridional overturning circulation. And also there's been a number of studies that have pointed out that having deep data is really important for initializing and um, constraining both uh, reanalysis and uh, ocean forecasting systems as, long, as well as the big GCMs. So, um, a number of communities uh, are looking for more 
consistent deep ocean data. So just to point out a little more on the ocean heat content and the importance of the deep ocean and kind of what we can say right now and what we don't know. Um, this is a, an updated figure from the yearly state of uh, the BAMP state of the climate. And on the upper, it shows mm -hmm. the ocean heat content increase from zero to 700 meters in zeta joules going back to 1995 and going forward. And then the bottom panel, you have the 700 to 2,000 meter estimate. And then at the very bottom, we have the 2,000 to 6,000 meter. And what I want to point out is that right now in the deep ocean at best was we can uh, look at it as if it was a linear um, global mean progression because all because we're only looking at data once per decade this is really the best that we can do right now and so therefore that line is straight and also that our air bars on that estimate is about half the signal so we do see that it's warming um, above the uh, statistically significant rate, but our air bar there plus or minus is about half of the signal that we see. And deep Argo, we're really, what we're looking to do is be able to resolve the deep ocean heat content on an annual basis and be able to really beat down that air. Um, and the reason why we think Argo is such a great platform for this is we can look at the upper ocean as an example. So if we look at the top figure again, I have two error bars just to point out the difference of pre versus post Argo error. In the 1995, we have a number of different lines on there, all representing estimates from different groups. And the reason why there's a huge spread in the error bars on each of those estimates they are so big is because there was a lot of regions of the ocean that had missing data. And then post 2005, once we have a global array of Argo, you see all those lines collapse on top of each other and the air bars go down, and as we go into 2020, it's a really nice, consistent picture. And the reason for that is now we have close to 4,000 floats on the ocean, profiling every 10 days and giving us very accurate estimates of temperature and salinity of upper 2,000 meters. And so that's what we hope Deep Argo will do. And so when we think about wanting to resolve this deep ocean heat and freshwater budget, what the call for the community was that we needed an array of about um, 1,200 floats to kind of um, fill the deep ocean. And so this is a paper from Johnson et al. in the study uh, trying to quantify exactly what's needed. Um, and 1,200 floats is going to give you one float every five degrees by five degrees. So it's more sparse than the upper ocean. Um, but it will uh, hopefully give us the signal that we want. That's just based on statistical understanding of the variance that we see in the deep ocean. And the idea of the deep float is being shown on the right. So Argo right now goes down to 1,000 meters, and then it floats for 10 days, it drops down to 2,000 meters, and then it pops back up to the surface and takes a profile. Deep Argo will work the same way, but instead of stopping at 2,000 meters, it will go all the way down to the bottom, and it will profile, and once again, in a similar manner, send its data back. Um, and so talking to the community, uh, the needs for the Deep Argo program, we really need something that's going to be able to measure the total heat storage in the whole ocean and understand what the contribution to the Earth's energy imbalance is, improve our understanding of regional and global sea level change, um, define spatial and temporal variability of the deep ocean circulation, which is still very sparsely sampled. Um, and and kind of provide the systematic top to bottom observations for data assimilation and ocean models. And so to do that, like I said, what the studies that we've done is said that we really need about 1,200 floats. Um, they need to be higher accuracy in temperature and salinity than the core, just because the variability, what we see in the deep ocean um, is a smaller, is is smaller so we're looking for accuracies that are very very good it's 0 0.001 degree c in temperature and 0 0.002 in salinity and about three decibars in pressure um, and from a financial standpoint um, the requirements for this ray is that it actually fulfills the same core mission as argo so what the idea is once we have this up every third Argo float is going to be a deep float. And so we're not adding 1,200 floats to the array because financially that would be a lot, but instead we're just making some percentage of the core Argo floats able to sample to the deep ocean. And so because 
that's the plan, they still need to be able to perform the core Argo mission, which is a 10-day profile, and with the idea that it's going to last about five years at least, and so that's about 250 profiles. Um, so there are a number of different models of deep floats out there, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the technological readiness. Um, being at Scripps, I'm going to talk about our model, which is called the Deep Solo. Um, the Deep Solo is actually very similar to our Core Argo in a lot of ways, but as you can see, it looks different than a Core Argo float. And so on the left is a picture of one of our Deep Solos in the water, um, and on the right is a schematic uh, from our float website. And they basically, we have switched from the aluminum um, uh, case, and now we're in a glass sphere. Um, and uh, the glass sphere is covered by that plastic casing just for protection. Um, and then inside the glass sphere, it basically works the same way where it's buoyancy driven. In the, this figure on the left, you can see this uh, rope hanging down. It's just a metal wire, and this is our very passive, clever um, bottom detection device. So basically, because they're buoyancy driven, um, once that wire, which is three meters long, touches the bottom, that mass starts to be lost from the float. And so the float can sense this because its pressure stops changing when it changes its buoyancy, and it says, oh, I'm at the bottom, and I'm going to stop going down. And so this is a very energy efficient way of detecting the bottom and not having it sit on the bottom. You can also see in this figure unlike an Argo float, the CTD is actually mounted on the side and at the bottom, um, and this has to do with the stability of the float and the fact that it's sphere. Um, but the guts of this is very similar. In the same way as a core Argo, we're going to have an interior and exterior bladder. It's going to pump oil from the inside into the outside, changing the volume of the float and allowing it to go up and down. Um, right now, we're running fairly efficient batteries, and we, uh, at least in these floats, are easily hitting the 250 cycle um, um, requirement as far as energy to be able to profile all the way down to 6,000 meters. Um, and our floats that are out right now um, are running a slightly modified version of the core uh, Argo uh, profiling mission. <laughs> And sorry, uh, the reason is we're still in the pilot array and we're trying to keep the floats staying where we put them. So we're parking them close to the bottom. But right now what they're doing is they're sinking to the bottom. They are sitting relatively close to the bottom, three-ish hundred meters off the bottom for 10 to 15 days. And then they're going back up. Another thing to note is that we are actually sampling on descent for our deep solo right now. Um, and this has been brought up for the real-time uh, people who are interested in real-time data. Once they do start replacing core Argo floats, one thing that we've proposed is sampling also on the ascent in the upper thousand meters so that the people that are interested in the real-time data are not looking at a 10-day um, delay between the profile time and the, the, the receiving of the data. Um, so I've been talking about the SIO, sorry, what? Slide? Oh, sorry. Um, there was a little bit of static. Uh, so uh, right now, because of the positioning of the CTD, the deep solo, just this model, is sampling on the descent. So it sits at the surface, it transmits this data, and then it takes its profile all the way to the bottom continuously. And then it sits for 10 days before it gets back to the surface. And therefore, when you get your profile transmitted, it's actually 10 days after it's been taken. And so um, the problem with that is for most applications, people don't mind because they don't care about the real-time data. But for some data, um, for some people who are doing short-term forecasting and stuff like that, the data is, very, the Argo data is very important. And so, and it's important that they get it in real time and that it's not 10 days old. And so what we were proposing to do is that for these is that they will sample continuously on the way down, and that will give us the best um, sample because the CDD is at the bottom. Um, and then we will also sample discreetly in the upper thousand meters, and that way the uh, forecast modelers will get real-time data that is a few hours old and not a few days old. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So I was just talking about the Steep Solo, which is uh, the one that we produce here at Scripps. Um, there are three other models out and active right now in the arrays. There's the Deep Ninja, um, which only goes down to 4,000 meters and being produced by Japan. There's the Deep Arvor, which is being uh, produced in France and goes down to 4,000 meters. And then there is also the Deep Apex, which is the other 6,000 meter model. Um, it works pretty similarly. You can see a picture on the left. It's also in the glass sphere versus the 4,000 meters have stuck with the cylinder um, casing and they've just reinforced that casing so that it can go down to 4,000 meters. Um, this picture is showing the current status of the array. Um, the, all of those dots on there are the deep Argo floats. There are currently 136 deep floats out. Uh, the color on here is showing which country is supplying. So right now the U.S. is has 86 of those 136 foot, so about half of the ray. Um, you can see, uh, but there's also substantial um, contributions um, from Japan and from France. Um, and right now, Australia only has three active, but I know that they are actively purchasing some more. China has also pledged to purchase quite a few floats. Um, and Europe is also trying to ramp up their deep Argo program. Um, so for the start, we're trying to concentrate the floats in a couple of pilot arrays. Um, in the middle of the screen, where you see all of those nice green dots, that's the Southwest Pacific Basin. This was the first pilot array that the U.S. started. Um, and that array has been maintained for the last three-ish years. Um, and we're hoping to continue to maintain that region. Um, and the other big cluster is the Brazil Basin, which is over to the right of off of South America. Um, and that array just started and went in the water this month. And so we're very excited to see that one come online. Um, and so with that, I want to just touch on a few of the scientific results that have been coming out of the array. Um, it's still a relatively new program. The oldest float has only been out for three years. Um, so it's exciting to see papers already coming out um, from the existing floats. And so, like I mentioned, there's these two arrays in the Southwest Pacific Basin. Um, and there's also existing arrays that are in the North Atlantic. Um, that has uh, mostly been maintained by France. And then we have some floats that we have jointly populated the Southern Ocean, the South Indian, um, with Japan and Australia. And so I wanna talk about results from those three, three regions. So the first region is the Southwest Pacific Basin. Like I mentioned, this is the oldest array that we have out, which shown on the left, this is a study done by Johnson et al in 2019. And what he was asking was, okay, now we have this array in this one specific basin. Can we start to resolve um, the ocean heat anomaly that we see in this basin with the deep Argo floats? And the answer is yes, they're doing a really great job of resolving that deep ocean warming signal. So what's shown on the left um, is just an example at 5,000 meters. What the color contours in the back is... Um, the uh, temperature at 5,000 meters from a climatology. And what the colored X's, uh, plus signs, circles, and diamonds are the floats. And they're colored by when they were deployed. Uh, some were deployed as early as 2014, and then others were deployed in early 2018. Um, and what you can do is at a given depth, look at the difference in the temperature that the Argo float is um, sampling compared to the climatology. The climatology is an accumulation of data collected over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, so the mean age of the climatology is older than the floats, but not exactly clear exactly what year that is. But regardless, when you look at the anomaly, that's what's plotted on the right. You see that the scatter of those dots is above zero. So the Argo floats are measuring temperatures at 5,100 5, decibars. That is warmer than the climatology. That's what we expect. This basin has been showing a warming um, trend over the last few decades. And then also what you can look at is you can actually look at the trend in the data over that three-year period. And so that's what the black line with the error bar is showing. It's the trend from all those Argo data going forward. 
And we can do that at every depth, and we can look at both the anomaly, which is on the top, from the climatology, and we can look at the trend, the three-year trend. And so what we see in the anomaly, that's about 10 millise um, warming from uh, the climatology. And if the climatology is uh, really centered around the 90s, that is very consistent with the change in temperature that we're seeing um, the long-term trend that we're seeing from the ghost of three peaks in this basin. But we can also look at the temperature trend over the last three years, and we see um, both statistically significant trends, which is showing interannual variability, and differences in water masses. So from 2,000 to 4,000 meters, where you're really in that Pacific deep water, it looks like it's cold. And in the Antarctic bottom water below 4,000 meters, it looks like it's warming at a rate that's um, actually higher than uh, what we've seen over the long-term decadal trend. And so uh, this is just demonstrating the kind of things that we should be able to do in terms of deep ocean heat content um, with the R deep R goal array. Um, the other mission that we're looking to do with the Deep Argo Array is to look at changes in circulation. So I'm going to jump to the Australian Arctic Basin, um, where there's been a few studies uh, looking at changes here. So this map is zoomed into Antarctica. The, the um, yellowish down at the bottom is Antarctica, and we're going up to about 60 south. Off of this plot, up to the right, Top corner is New Zealand, and if you went straight up, you would be in Australia. So we're looking uh, at Antarctica right south. Um, where that big star is, is uh, the Delhi coast, where we have deep water formed. And one of the things that we're seeing with the Antarctic bottom water is that there's been this long-term trend that we are seeing less of it. Um, especially in this basin, it looks like we have decreased the amount of deep water that is ventilating the ocean, and this is really driving the warming. And so in this study, um, what they did was they took uh, the long-term trend going back to 1990, which in the bottom left uh, figure is what you're seeing. This is all ship-based data, and they looked at the trend of, I'm calling it the contraction, but it's the volume um, of Antarctic bottom water. Um, and you see this long-term trend, and then at the end, what they see is um, the float data, and then I've zoomed in on the float data over on the right. And so, first of all, you can still get a trend of the decrease uh, using the float data just over that year and a half period, but you can also see this interannual variability. And what they've related that interannual variability is directly back to um, changes in the ice scape. So basically, you have calving events um, in these formation regions, and the amount of ice in the ice. Uh, sea ice production can all feed into the amount of Antarctic bond water being produced, and these are processes that we don't really understand and that are really important to climate. So more data close to the sources will really shed a lot of light on that. In addition, in this region, we've seen this long-term freshing signal. And so what I'm looking at here is just in this box, the colors in the back are, again, the ship based data, and now I'm looking at temperature and salinity space. Sorry, I forgot to label this, but the y-axis is temperature and the x-axis is salinity and the colors are going back in time so red is the 1990 data through the 2016 and what we see is with this general progression from salty bottom water and i'm zoomed in on the tina space all the way at the bottom from very salty all the way to fresh and then the float data is sitting on top and so what this is really just demonstrating is that the float data salinities are accurate enough to kind of compare to historical data to capture this freshening signal. And in addition, I want to zoom in on uh, this bottom part. Sorry, I'm switching to UNS. This is just zoomed out a little bit so you can see where it is. Maybe I should have started with this. But again, this is showing the TNS properties in this region now. I've zoomed out a lot up to the um, salinity maximum, which is really the circumpolar deep water. And the Antarctic bottom water is down at the bottom of that TNS. And I have the little insert here, which just shows the tightness of the curve first at, in that um, modified circumpolar deep water versus at the bottom where we see the spread. Um, and the reason for that is because we have different water masses coming in. Um, and so really quickly backing up, one thing that we see is this gradual freshening over time. But in the float data, in this black, it's a little hard to see. But if you notice, there's been a little kink um, in the TNS space. It's actually going a little more salty again. And so we looked at that in detail. 
And this is just zoomed in on that. It's a little hard without a pointer. I apologize for that. But what I want to point out is that there are multiple end members coming into here, multiple forms of Antarctic bottom water. And so where I had the star before, that's the Delhi coast, and it's a very cold, fresh variety of Antarctic bottom water. We see that pouring out in, in all of the floats. But in some of the floats, we also see the signature of the Rossi bottom water coming around Cape Odair off of this figure because the Rossi is over to the right and it's coming in. And the float that's in red, which is also shown in the red TNS, is going to experience most of that. And so you see where that float is around 150 east in longitude under that red, that red arrow. Uh, we're really still seeing Rossi bottom water at the bottom. And uh, in TNS place, you see that a number of those floats are getting that Rossi bottom water sitting on top of the um, the Adeli land bottom water uh, in it coming in. And that is uh, subject to intergalant variability. So in some of the ship-based data, we don't see that. But the Rossi for this year seems to be producing more Antarctic bottom water, and it's coming into this basin, which is exciting to see. So it's pulling that whole curve back towards the right a little bit, making it a little more salinity. And then finally, the last thing we can see in this basin are some smaller dynamics. Uh, this is just pointing to one float that came in on the shelf and under over the winter, it got pushed out while it was under sea ice and very quickly got evicted off the shelf. And if you look at the bottom properties, it was sitting in this plume of very cold water. And so this is just showing the mean temperature and the mean salinity in the middle two. And then the meter is the height of this plume as it gets evicted off. And so it was interesting to see the velocity that the float came off being parked at the bottom and the bottom properties that it looks like it was entrained in one of these uh, bottom water um, plumes coming off the shelf into the interior basin. And then last but not least, uh, some results from the North Atlantic Array. Uh, the upper right-hand figure shows where the floats were. Um, so we are all the way now switched poles and in the North Atlantic. And these floats were deployed uh, south of um, Greenland, and some of them were entrained in, they were parked at a depth so that they were in the North Atlantic deep water being produced and being evicted into the North Atlantic. Um, and what you can do is on the right, and these ones were also had oxygen in, in addition to temperature and salinity, is look at the properties along this pathway, which are the three colored panels on the left, the contour plots. And what this study did was identify these water masses and also used an OMP analysis to kind of look at the relative fraction and look how that ice shelf water um, was mixed away as it's evicted along that pathway, which is um, another really interesting thing we can do with the deep floats, looking at the flow um, of the deep circulation. Um, so in conclusion, um, Currently, there's about 136 active floats. Um, the community has calls for about 1,200 flo deep floats needed to really reach global impl implementation. We have a number of pilot arrays that are demonstrating the technological readiness and um, already producing interesting insight into the deep ocean. Um, this has been an international effort. Uh, about half of the floats, again, are coming from the US and the other half are coming from international partners. Um, and so what we're looking for and hoping is that we can get Deep Argo up and running and that it's going to um, improve our understanding um, of ocean heat content, sea level rise, and deep ocean circulation. And so with that, I will take questions. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so if we, we'll have a few minutes to take questions. If you have a question, please take yourself off mute and feel free to speak up. Hello, Sarah. This is Chen Alipo. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you very much for this uh, uh, very interesting presentation, this little tour of the deep ocean. Um, I think you said, um, I forgot at the beginning, you said the plan was maybe to substitute some of the, um, I want to say, regular Argo floats for the deep Argo floats, is that correct? Yeah, uh, eventually, yes. Eventually, so hopefully if that happens and if deep Argo is implemented. So do you know about the drift characteristics of the deep Argo floats compared to the regular Argo floats because I believe the 10 day displacement is used in, as an estimate of ocean velocity at, at 1000 decibar. So are we going to get the same type of drip measurements with these deep Argo floats? Yes, so that is a really good question. Um, so reason why we have not started substituting yet and we are still considering deep Argo in a pilot phase is because we are still trying to figure out 
exactly what the mission is going to look like, um, make sure that the floats are performing well enough that they're going to last the whole five years. Um, none of them have been out for five years, so we don't really know the answer to that. We can only estimate how much battery life is on board. Um, and we're actually using a slightly different CDD. It's still from Seabird, but it's not the 41, it's the 61. Um, so we want to make sure that that's performing well. So all those things are keeping this in the pilot phase um, for the moment. Once we move out of the pilot phase and start doing that switch, um, then to keep the trajectory data, which is what you're referring to is the, the thousand meter plot um, or the thousand meter drift, uh, it hasn't 100% been decided, but there is a push to keep them parked at 1,000 meters. Um, I, I personally feel like it's very important to keep that drift data because we don't want to decrease the trajectory files or have half of them parked at some depth and parked at the other. For the pilot array, we're parking them deep because we want them to stay in the deep basin that we put them in. Once it goes global, that's less of a concern. If they drift from one deep basin to another, Hopefully, at equal time, there will be a deep float from that deep basin coming back. And so once we're at global, the, their movement in and out of basins won't be so problematic. And I do want to mention that this is actually one of three extensions of Argo that we're really pushing right now. And so this came out in the white paper, and really what the Argo community is pushing for is this vision for 2025, which is to not only ramp up deep Argo, but also ramp up biogeochemical Argo, and to enhance the core. And so instead of having a Argo fleet that is all just measuring TNS, we will have um, a fleet that's basically a third core, core floats, a third biogeochemical floats that have all the extra sensors, and a third deep. And it will look like this um, picture that's on the left where we have a bunch. And like deep, maybe when, for deep floats, it might make more sense to park them at the bottom. You get um, interesting information about the circulation at the bottom from doing that. And for biogeochemical, they might want to switch things up. But um, if we want this unified Argo, I think they all need to be doing the same mission, which is parking at 1,000 meters, sampling to depth, and then coming back up and transmitting their data. And that's pretty much the agreement um, of the community right now. Okay. Well, Thank Karen, you very this much. Is Michelle. I had a question for you actually on the biogeochemical Argo. So is the idea um, that it could, that would be sort of a separate entity or that perhaps some of the biogeochemistry measurements could be part of the um, deep Argo as well? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, right now, there uh, we start with CNS because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, there is definitely a really strong interest in adding oxygen to the deep floats. Um, the oxygen sensor is does is very reliable. Um, it will give us accuracies that will show variations in the deep ocean, um, and it, it it seems worth trying to add. And so we haven't put it on the soil yet, but we've been talking about it. Uh, the four thousand meter floats, um, the Arvar is does have an oxygen sensor on it. Um, as far as the other biogeochemical sensors, um, uh, I think they'll be slower to be added, but it's not out of the question. I think right now, um, many of the sensors use the deep, the 2,000 meter values from the climatology to help um, calibrate the data um, and apply any offsets needed. Uh, so right now, the deep values are really coming back to the climatology, and so having the data all the way to the bottom might not add a huge amount. And so it's a question of scientific need, uh, expense. <laughs> the biogeochemical sensors are very expensive. Um, and balancing those two things, um, there is really nothing limiting adding more sensors to these other than just adding more batteries. Um, so right now we're starting with simple, but um, but yeah, I think we'll see oxygen soon and maybe some of the other sensors if there's scientific need for it. That's good to know. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. This is Anish. Hi. Well, go ahead, Anish. Uh, just a quick question. Thanks again for the great overview. Regarding the floats that are under CI, like, do they detect CI when they come to the surface and they stop and go back down or how does that work and does that affect the frequency of data 
relate back? Yeah, so they have the same ice detection algorithm that the core floats do. So basically, ice and the antennas on the Argo floats don't get along particularly well. Um, and so uh, they, when they come up, they uh, start asking the question as if there are freezing conditions above, and it's basically just based on temperature. Um, and if the water is colder than negative 1.9 degrees C in that upper mix layer, they don't surface. They just stop um, before they get too close to the ice and they go back down and they store their profile all winter. Um, so you get a full profile minus the upper few tens of meters, and but what you don't get is a GPS fix. Um, and so one of the nice things about the deep Argo floats that we're experimenting with is different ways of using the bottom depth because while we don't know your lat lawn, you do know exactly within three meters how deep of water you're in. And so the data that I was showing you before where we had a lot of winter data um, around Antarctica and those floats were coming in and off the shelf, it's on this nice slope. And so if it's in 4,000 meters, we know roughly the latitude. And if it's in 3,000 meters, we know roughly the latitude because you're on the continental slope and it, it, uh, the float is kind of moving up and down. And so that is useful information to kind of constrain the position. Um, but yeah, just like the core floats when they're under ice, we don't have an exact um, fix. Okay, thanks, uh, yeah, that's clever, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, Sam. I see. This is, yeah, this is, Mike, this is Mike Patterson with the US Fiber Project Office, and thanks for this overview. Um, this five year implementation uh, or the target for 2025 global implementation um, is ambitious, and it's something that I think uh, we'll be having to, upcoming discussions in the next year about how we can capitalize on Ocean Ops 19 and those white papers to. Um, to ensure U.S. investments <laughs> downstream to populate the global ocean along these lines. Um, between now and then, though, in terms of where future deployments would be made and what, how decisions are made um, in the international arena, uh, but also uh, within the U.S. and the investments that are where, where we go next, um, it, what's, what, what would be the next, if you get another infusion of funds for deployment, do you have plans for the next region that you would tackle, and um, what would be the rationale for that? We, with our U.S. AMOC program or science team within our, within the U.S., there there could be great interest for working, particularly with the French and the, and uh, the other Europeans who have ambitions for the North Atlantic, um, mm -hmm. putting floats in there as well. Yeah. Um, so um, that. Right now, um, so the North Atlantic is very high on our list. We can just start with that. Um, there are those really nice floats up south of Greenland, and we've started to populate um, the North Atlantic, really deploying off the rapid line. Um, and we're hoping in the next three years, we're just talking about this, is looking for opportunities to put more floats in that basin. And that would be great because it would be connecting um, the pathway that's a really important region as far as deep water formation and circulation and it would connect to uh, the rays to the north um, as far as general deployment plans um, it we have started these arrays um, or the pilot arrays and our first uh, our our highest um, interest is just to maintain the arrays that we already have so that's the one south um, in the Southwest Pacific Basin, the Brazil Basin, um, and south of Australia, and then into the North Atlantic. Um, and we are working very closely with international partners. Um, so the U.S. obviously we have can make we make decisions basically by institution, but we are talking heavily to all of our international collaborators, and um, it's great where we can overlap our floats because, like I said, we have different models and they all have slightly different. Um, as we go through development, uh, we want to make sure that the array is consistent with each other. So we're looking for crossover and we're looking to populate the deep basins. Um, so far, we've really been looking for regions that are close enough to formation regions that have shown historical warming trends, um, that they're scientifically interesting, but also regions where we have really good reference data um, because it's still a new program. And um, I think once we have more confidence in the floats, we'll start to deploy them in all over, but really that's, um, the Southwest Pacific Basin has great reference data and that's one of the reasons why we started there. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, may I ask a question? This is Antonietta. Yeah. Okay, thank you again for this uh, great presentation. Um, uh, so I'm actually interested uh, in the map that you showed of the different uh, type of argon. There is the core argos, and you mentioned that, uh, uh, yes, exactly, the core argo, the enhanced coverage in the equatorial region. Um, so what is the rationale for that? Uh, what is, I mean, the main motivation and uh, uh, Will uh, those fluids have also biogeochemical sensors? Um, yeah, so, okay, so the, I didn't talk about this. So there has been a, um, a push for a, a long time to enhance certain regions of high variability in the upper ocean uh, that Argo is thought to be undersampling in terms of the variability that we see in there. And so the equatorial region, so you see all across the equator, um, we think we're slightly undersampling, so they want more floats. And then also in the western boundary currents, it's a little hard to see, but in all of the deep, or in all the western boundary currents here, we are proposing to enhance and also to hit some of the marginal seas, which Argo has not mm -hmm. traditionally um, covered. And so you can see that in this map compared to where Argo currently is, we're trying to actually get uh, coverage in those marginal seas. Um, the Equatorial Pacific in particular I can speak to about BGC because there's been a big push um, with TPOS and kind of the revamp of the Equatorial Observing System. There is a biogeochemical component to that as you guys probably know at Clivar um, and we are looking to, uh, there's a few, there's quite a few biogeochemical floats there now um, and to continue to enhance that array. So our first floats, we actually just got a grant to build five biogeochemical floats and they will go to the Equatorial Pacific um, because it's just a really interesting biogeochemical region um, to start looking at those, those fluxes um, and yeah, the dynamics going on there. So yeah, um, as far as the biogeochemical float distribution, right now the plan is to have them relatively evenly distributed and not necessarily higher in places like the Equatorial Pacific, but um, certainly if there's scientific region, that plan can develop. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any final questions for Sarah? All right, so I don't see anyone else speaking up. Um, so I just want to take this time and thank you, Sarah, for presenting for us one more time um, and for preparing everything that you have for us. We had a great turnout today. I think we had almost 15 um, participants at this uh, webinar. So uh, a recording of this webinar will be available by early next week, and I'll send out an announcement once it's available. Um, and our next pause panel webinar is scheduled for March 5th. So I will be in touch with Michelle and Shane to organize that one. And once we have the information, we'll send it out to everyone as well. Thank you everyone for joining us today.